Welcome to the Weekly Benefit Roast, featuring Benefit Indemnity Corporation's President, Roger Bain. Roger has devoted more than 30 years to understanding and developing innovative health benefits plans for large groups and groups as small as five employees. Our moderator is Bob Graham. Take it away, Bob. Hey, 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 it's the Benefit Roast, and I am happy to be here today. It's been a stressful couple of minutes, had a little technical difficulties. Had a little debate and discussion, but we're here, we're ready, we're rocking and rolling. We are ready to go into more of the discussion of benefits for businesses and how they can operate more efficiently, more effectively. And before we get into our topic today, which is a really good one, we're going to give you uh, one or two case studies that really point out the many, many benefits of what we've been talking about every week. Before we do that, I want to point out to you that you can use the chat function to the right on your screen. You go to chat and you can send us a note or comment or question, and we will integrate those into our discussion. If you also want to um, become part of the discussion, you can indicate that there. Just say you want to come on, and if we're able to do it, we will add you, and you can actually talk to us. Roger, before we get started, let me get, let me just point out a couple of the people we have on. We have Dana in uh, Dana's in Maryland. We've got George in Michigan. We've got Amber in is that Seattle? Um, they're going by so quickly, I can't keep up with all of them. And uh, well, with that, Roger, I'm sure Amber in Seattle and all everyone else on there scrolling through. Thanks for joining us. Why don't you say hi, Roger, and uh, kick us off? Hi, Roger. Wow, it's been that kind of day with Roger. <laughs> Sorry, guys, you, you left me no choice, Bob. Okay, uh, all right. That. So today we're going to walk through one or two case studies. And I know we've been working on some case studies for some website stuff. And as we were looking at these case studies the other day, we sort of had that epiphany that these would be really great to share because they indicate just how well self-funding can work for an organization. And so why don't you uh, walk us through one of those? Well, they would do that, Bob. And I've got a couple of great case studies. And we've actually got a lot of great case studies. But uh, today, we're just going to discuss two. And one of them, I have a few notes and slides. And the other one crashed with those te technical difficulties you were mentioning earlier. But we can talk through it either way. And I think the audience will find some really interesting components to that. Um, as we go through. So in looking at these case studies first, the first employer that I'm going to talk about was a reasonably large employer. It was 200 and almost 250 employees when I was first <coughs> introduced to them. Sorry, folks, okay. we're just dealing with some technical difficulties today. So you were telling us about about 250 a, a group, employees. Group was, group was well over 200 employees, almost 250 when I met them. ACA had passed. This was in the range of late 2013. The Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, however you want to describe it. And it required that everybody get coverage or suffer significant penalties for employers over 50. I was introduced, introduced to this. Over 50 employees, not over, over 50 years 50 old. Employers. Remember, employees. not everyone's as hip to this as you are, Roger. Sorry, I'll slow down. Okay, so I'm now excited. So now we've got this 250 employee company thereabouts, and they're required to offer coverage to all of their employees or suffer the Part A penalty under the Affordable Care Act. And that Part A penalty would have been two thousand dollars per employee if any one per month or per year per year per year. If okay. any one employee in the company went to the exchange to get a tax subsidy for their coverage, then that would kick in the penalty on the entire block of employees of 250 after the first 30. So in essence, $480,000 worth of penalties. So when you look at that scenario, Ouch. yeah, you're looking at a huge deal. And in looking closer at the group, We've got all kinds of bells and whistles going off today. This is, this is quite a popular day. In looking at the group, yeah, I'm not sure where they're coming from because we shut all those down. Well, so it's people it's, excited to hear this, right? Yeah, it's a continued technical difficulty. So my apology to all of you out there. Anyway, this group, when we looked at it more closely, we realized they only had 24 employees covered out of the 250. 
And upon examination, we realized that the reason they only had 200 or 24 out of over 200 is because they really only offered it to their management team, their key employees, foremen, full-time people that are there in, in their shop all the time. So with that limited offering, they only got 24 covered and they were going along with that just fine until the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which required all of these imposing things. And these imposing things, looking at this significant amount of potential tax penalty under the Affordable Care Act, uh, was a pretty ugly scenario. So the solution we had to engage is to offer multiple plans, right? We didn't want every com- every person, employee, and this was a landscaping firm, by the way, right. which meant they had a lot of low-income employees, not quite seasonal. They were actually there enough hours that they're counted as a long-term full-time employee. So they had to be offered coverage. Lots of laborers working out Lots on of laborers working and in the yards field. and all those types of things. That's correct. So our solution was to offer multiple plans. And the first plan we offered was just a base plan. So can you, before you go through each of the plans, explain why you're offering multiple plans. Go a li- little slower because well, I know you understand, but I'm still foggy myself. There are several reasons. My firm, we almost always offer multiple plans regardless of the employer situation because no two employees are alike in any company. And they like to make their own benefit decisions, at least within some parameters. And so some employees want a richer plan than other employees. If you're about to have start a new family, you might want a little richer benefits, a little lower deductibles, because you've got enough expense coming sure. in other areas. So you buy a, a richer plan. In this case, we offer four different plans for a very specific reason. And that specific reason is that we had over 200 new employees coming into the plan, many of which- Employees that hadn't taken a plan in the past. That hadn't even been offered a plan in the past, but also that from the employer's experience, were not likely to take a conventional health insurance plan. Okay. It's simply too expensive for their wages, et cetera. So what the employer, what we did is we offered a minimum essential coverage plan. Now, this is the minimum standard requirement under the ACA. So it's this not is the bare bones? Bare bones coverage. It is not anything I would recommend that any employer offer to employees that are used to having health coverage. But if they have none, they're low income, and they're not intending, and they're not going to enroll in a health plan that requires any kind of contribution from them, then this is a plain vanilla bare bones plan that you can enroll people in at a very low cost. Meets the ACA requirements and it gives them some it meets, coverage. It meets that minimum ACA. Without going into a whole ACA right, lesson right. today, it meets the minimum requirements, but it's not coverage I would recommend for anybody, okay. but it helps the employer solve for a multitude of problems, including participation. Okay. If we didn't offer this plan, the group would never meet the participation requirements put forth by risk takers and they're meaning, i.e. insurance companies, they won't take a group unless they have 75% participation, or sometimes they'll go to 60%. But this group would have never had 60% of their employees except this richer- Because their employees couldn't have afforded it. Exactly, so they wouldn't buy up. And so because of that- So this is part of the creativity that you're bringing to this situation. You're looking at an individual situation and finding ways to make this work. It's a combination of expertise, creativity, but probably, Bob, flexibility. Okay. That is offered in the world of what we do in self-funding that you just don't get in the fully insured world. So there's some significant differences there. So anyway, we are allowed. They, we then have a buy-up plan that we offered that's a little bit richer, well, considerably richer than that. And at the time, under the ACA regulations, was a full-blown qualified minimum value plan. What's that mean in English? Well, what it means is... The, the feds required a certain plan that is called valuable and affordable. And again, you're going to force me into discussing the entire training I'm of, sorry. of the ACA. And I don't think we want to get to All that. Well, 2,100 but, pages? Right. Well, 1,300 anyway. Sorry. But Felt like 2,100. Yeah. So we're going to try and avoid okay. that for a minute. And we're going to simply talk about a little bit different scenario. And that is that. We'd like to offer something inexpensive to more employees, but better coverage 
than just that preventive only. So we offered a plan that covered office visits, lab, x-ray, covered a whole lot of stuff, but it wouldn't cover surgery, hospital, or the most expensive drugs. But it did cover a whole lot of other. So most of your routine kinds of care, it sounds All like. All the routine not kinds the of care, stuff. but not the big ticket stuff. And that okay. cost about half of what a traditional PPO would cost. Okay. And so it was a tremendous advantage. So some employees, it's a good entry plan. Again, if you're on a full level traditional plan, I would never recommend that you buy down to that. But if you have nothing, this is a lot, a lot better. Okay. You can get your treatment and care regimen under control and in place and help hopefully prevent those big, terrible accidents. And so there's some really nice scenarios to that. But then, of course, we offered even more. And we offered two plans of traditional plans that are minimum value. And in fact, were very, very good plans for the management team. But they had also a high and low option for those people that are in the market for traditional coverage. So. What we're really referring to now is creating a solution. Instead of demanding one size fits all, we created four different sizes for this whole population. Now, granted, that's not like T-shirts that might have six or eight different sizes, but it's pretty darn good. And, and so this we is had all within the same plan. These options are within the big umbrella of the plan that the all... employer is offering. So this wasn't you were saying. Either they pick plan A, B, or C, and everyone has to go with one or the other. It was up to the employee to choose any of these four options. That's correct. correct. All four okay. plans were offered to the employees on the exact same terms so that it would qualify under the ACA. And those employees that couldn't afford the richer plans bought the less expensive. But bottom line is, we now got people covered. So to do this, you use a self-funded platform, and we save a whole lot of money as compared to conventional plans. And we get refunds back of any claims funds that were not used. To the employer. Refund back to the employer. So the employer gets to keep their claims money if they don't spend it. So that's a pretty big deal as and well. And you avoid the potential penalties in that. And you avoid potential penalties in that. That's correct. Seems like a real win for everyone. Well, so here's the final verdict. They met the participation guidelines. Okay. They satisfied the ACA requirements without a single penalty. They saved hundreds of thousands of dollars as compared to conventional and short options for this group. And they received even more savings by getting some of their claims surplus back. And I just got an update that one year they got $34,000 and another year in, a they, ref, in refund in for uns cla unspent claims dollars that the group actually got back. So first they save hundreds of thousands of dollars by using this strategy over an insured plan. Second, even then on what they did spend, it was reduced by 34,000 in one year, 27,000 in another year, two years, they didn't get a refund back but they're now in their fifth year, still with us, still in the plan because it is still the most competitive option for them. And I'm not sure where their current surplus status is, but they're still here and doing a great job. And, they and love you have a lot of employees covered that weren't covered under the previous situation. Oh, yeah, I didn't mention that. The, the group over doubled in size on good quality coverage. And added probably another 60 or 70 on decent coverage to get them back into the healthcare system. And then the rest were on that preventive only scenario. Okay. So it really was a major improvement in the healthcare status for a whole lot of employees. So, so Roger, we do this. We've talked over 14 or 15 weeks about these. And every time we go through something like this, I have the same question in my head. This seems too good to be true. How can this be? You've made things better for the employer. They've avoided fines. They're saving money. They're covering more people. You've made it good for employees because they have a whole bunch of options. Why isn't this universally accepted? Well, for starters, it is universally accepted. But many people in the small group market don't recognize that. Okay. And I think we've said in other Benefit Rose discussions that well over 60% of America's workers are covered by a self-funded health plan. But that's typically in the larger 
market size. There are fewer Big companies with thousands of employees. Well, even, even 200 employees or more, okay. it becomes very common. Under 200 employees, a little less common. Under 100 employees, even more uncommon. In fact, you're probably looking less than 10% market penetration in that under 100 employee market for self-funding. However, I've been doing self-funded for 32 years, as you know, and we've done it for thousands of groups over the years, and we have some really good success, and we have a lot of these case studies, and this one is just one we're highlighting today. And the second one that we, I, I meant to get some slides for, and I apologize to folks that they don't have them because of our technical crash before the webinar, but we had a much smaller company that had in the range of 17 employees. Okay. And this employer saved about 8% in their first year with us because our coverage was as good or better than what they had. Okay. And we were 8% less expensive. The broker, than, that, than their prior coverage. Than their prior coverage. So the broker brought that to us and said, you know what, let's do this. And then they got a refund in unused claim surplus dollars in that first year that reflected somewhere around a total savings of 20%. Wow. Okay. The second year, the group was renewing, and the broker compared us to the very best options they could find in the marketplace that have comparable coverage. And the traditional market. In, the tr in every other market, okay. you know, including other self-funded players, okay. from what I understand. And the broker shopped that and compared that benchmark of, of the competitors to what our renewal was, and the savings had increased to about 20%. Okay, wow. Okay, not only had the savings increased to about 20%, but they got another surplus refund that year of an even larger amount. Okay. The third year, same story, 20% thereabouts in savings and another refund. The fourth year, same thing. I think the savings dropped to about 16%, from the closest competitor. From 20 to 16, but right. still savings. Exactly. So in essence, as we continue, what we're saying is we've gone through this group now since 2013. It's still in force. It's got a surplus refund of claims, unused claims dollars every year except for one. And they're still getting rate renewals that are blowing away the competition with significant savings, even in years when they don't get a claim surplus refund. And that's only 17 employees. So there's a, a lack of understanding in the market. To answer your question in, in the short way, there's a lack of understanding in the market of that self-funding isn't really all employer risk. Self-funding buys a lot of insurance. An awful lot of insurance is sold to employers that are self-funding their health plan. And that insurance protects that employer's budget for their health plan, just like it would in a fully insured world, or much like it would in a fully insured world. It's protecting the employer from losses. So as long as we're going to continue to build self-funded plans, it's not about the size of the group. It's about the contract that you offer the group. And as long as you're providing the employer the protection for their budget that they need, you can self-fund at any group size. That's the element. That's the short answer to your question is there's a lack of understanding in the marketplace of what's available for small groups to do these kinds of creative things. And the group that at the first case study today, at the time they started with 24 employees covered on their plan, everybody else was shopping them like a small group under the ACA. But they weren't a small group. They were 250 employees. Right. And people were doing it simply wrong. Because it didn't even qualify for small group. So it's just enlightenment, education, and continuing that growth curve is what's most important, is just to continue to teach employers and brokers throughout the country how the small group self-funded market works to help employers save thousands and tens of thousands of dollars every year. Okay, we have a question from Celeste in Missouri. Celeste Missouri has a great question here. I can't wait to read this one to you, Roger. Her question is, my brokers never mentioned this to me, not once. What should I do? And I know you come up against this all the time. Celeste, you have two choices. You can mention it to your broker in a simple fashion called a demand. <laughs> demand 
that your broker get you other options and deliver them all to you so that you can review them. And specifically, or, you could say, I'd like to see a self-funded option. In I want to see every, I want to see every options. small group self-funded option available to me in my market. Right. 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 I mean, and that's how many would that be in a market? Typically, are we talking at, three or at 30 l- or? at least five and as many as 20? OK, so it just depends on the market and, and what's okay. there and the, and the group. Right. Okay. Well, Celeste is in Missouri. Would you have a guess? In Missouri? Right. But but it's not just that. It's a okay. question of how big they are and what industry. Okay. Some gotcha. of the self-funded players will restrict industries. Others won't. So, okay. you know, but but I can guarantee you there's at least five. OK. I mean, it's just there. there there's too many of them. Um, so that's one thing for Celeste. And Celeste, if your broker still is uncomfortable with that, or or shows any indifference, that indifference is usually born in a certain prejudice that is costing you money. And don't allow a broker's prejudice to cost you money. You either demand it or you call me and I'll get you a new broker that knows what he's doing in that regard. And not that your broker doesn't know what he's doing, but he's got to know the self-funded market too in order to give you justice. And the system in some ways, Roger, I'll say this, you can't because you're a licensed broker, but I can say it from the outside looking in, which is there are some um, benefits to a broker in not going down this road. This road can require a little uh, more effort in the front end, and there might be a change in the compensation model potentially for the broker, correct? Well, that's what's really interesting. It's not, there is, a, sometimes it's a little more work to get started. Once you've done that, it's a piece of cake. But you're right. Um, some brokers are being paid significant bonuses by the big carriers for keeping the business with them. And those bonuses could be jeopardized if the employee starts going out to give every employer their best deal. So it becomes a question of whether the broker would be working for the benefit of the client or more for the broker and the insurance carrier. Well, that's true. Who does the broker represent? Technically, under the law, broker represents the company, the client. And an agent would represent an insurance company. Um, so you have to be careful with that because a lot of people call themselves broker and they'll claim to be representing their clients and yet sometimes are clouded. They have their vision clouded by compensation models. So how can I know it's definitely a broker I'm working with? Is there a way to check that? I don't understand the question. It, you said some people are agents. Oh, they're, no, they'll, they'll still be licensed and registered as a broker. They just might might not they they just might have their broker's role clouded by compensation, Gosh, okay. and so they don't deliver it the same way. You know, and so would it be a good question to ask a broker if I were de- a small business owner working with a broker? How do you get compensated on each of these options that you're showing me? You know, it's an intelligent question to ask, but if you have to ask that of your broker, you need a new broker. Okay. Right. It's not the, not because your broker should have told you all of that, but because you have that much doubt in what your broker is doing. If you doubt your broker, find a new one that you can trust. Plain and simple. You should never have to doubt your broker. And if anything I've said today makes you doubt your broker, there's a problem. Your broker should have already educated you on all of these kinds of choices. You should already see and know. If your broker hasn't done that, there's a problem. I don't know what it is. And, and if your broker can't explain it when first asked the question, don't let him come back two weeks later with some high flutin answer. You find out today why you don't know about these other options. And if you don't like the first blush answer you get from your broker, then find a new one. Well, with that, Roger, I, I I knew this this would be an interesting day, and 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 it didn't disappoint me. Tell me uh, how someone can reach you, whether they want to talk about possibly moving forward with some of this self funding for their company and ask you more questions, or it sounds like you might be able to connect someone with the broker that might be more in keeping with what they're trying to do. Yeah, we really don't compete with brokers, Bob. We do almost all of our business through brokers. When I say almost, I've got one client that I've had on the books since 1988 
that is still my client. But that's, you are a that's registered it. insurance broker yourself. Yes, that is but, correct. But you but we work create as, the products, the, the insurance products. That insurance and then and insurance brokers come to us for solutions for their customers. And they're the go-between. That's they're the correct. middle person. Right. So, some small business owners may not understand that nuance. Exactly. So so you can refer your broker to us, or you can call us and have us refer you to a new broker. Either way. Just let us know what you'd like to do or, or just call and we can talk about it and find out. But again, my name is Roger Bain. I'm at 443-275-7412. And anytime you have a question about it or you need to talk about your broker or you want a new broker, or maybe you just need a security blanket just to, to gain confidence in your broker. I'm not trying to replace your broker. If he's a good broker or she's a good broker, there's no reason to change. But if you really have lost confidence, then that's a crisis for you because this expense is too big for you to not know that you're on the right track. So give me a call anytime you need to. Okay. Well, with that, Roger, uh, we want to thank people for their time that they've spent with us today. Uh, I think beyond the lessons that they've learned, I've certainly picked up a lot today. But we also have the opportunity for you to get a cup of coffee on us uh, so you can uh, drink your cup of coffee next time while you listen to us again. All you have to do is go to that form. You can see the link. It's in the chat box. It's also on the screen if you're looking on the screen. And if you go in and fill that form out, we will send you a nice... Uh, uh, way to get a free cup of coffee in the next week or two, but you've got to fill out that form on our website to do that because we need that. Right. We're, we're going to send you a really nice coupon that does have value to it. So when we send you that coupon, we want to make sure we have the appropriate address. So please fill out the form, make sure it's up to date and we'll get it right out to you. And guys, look, I want to thank you all for coming out. I know it's a lot every week to come out and listen to us, but we very appreciate it and uh, appreciate the feedback. And feel free, uh, for those of you that don't know, next time you join us, you, you feel free to click the question button and, and fire away at us with questions throughout. Thank Roger, you, guys. what's an email for you in case they have questions? Because sometimes it's easier for them to email before they call. Well, rather than spell the whole thing out, let me just tell you, send an email to info at benefitindemnity.co. It's either that or roger.bain, and then you've okay. got to spell all that out. But info at benefitindemnity.co comes directly to me as well. Okay. So you can send that or you can find it on our website. Anything you'd like to do, just reach out and let us know. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. We'll see you next week for another episode of The Benefit Roast. Thank you, guys. You've been listening to The Benefit Roast, a weekly discussion sponsored by Benefit Indemnity Corporation. Employers in a wide range of fields are using employer-owned health benefits plans to deliver better benefits to their employees at a lower cost. Learn more at BenefitIndemnity.co. That's BenefitIndemnity.co. See you again next week.